Lord, we just uh, ask that your word is just, uh, is just opened up, Lord, that we can all hear and understand and know what it is that, that Brother Bill's uh, saying, Father. We just uh, thank you for loving us the way you do. We thank you for Jesus Christ. Lord, just uh, go with us and, and keep us safe tonight as we leave this place. Be with us this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, just a couple of announcements. The Puppet Ministry, uh, Band of Believers, is over in the Children's Department, and it's up through fifth grade. So if you have any that want to come this week, uh, we'd love to have them over there, be a part of that, and they're going to have a great, great week. And, uh, hey, one other thing, Wednesday night, our Wednesday night meal, don't forget, it's normally we eat at 5.30, but we're going to eat at 5 this week because the revival starts at 6. So plan to be here. I know Miss Kathy's going to cook us up something big tonight, that night. And so I know you'll want to be a part of it. Six o'clock, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. Uh, if you want to be here to pray with us, we're going to meet in the fellowship hall at 530. So everyone's invited. If you want to come, be a part of that prayer time. And one other thing, the Rolling Hills ministry, the trailer that's out here on the parking lot. Uh, we've had it open today, but it'll be open uh, the next three days. Uh, you can bring stuff during the day while the secretaries are here, or I'll make sure it's open back up at 5 o'clock in the evening. So if you come for the revival and you want to bring stuff to put in there, they'll take furniture, clothes, you know, pictures, things you hang on the wall, whatever you have. You know, obviously don't bring anything if it's not nice <laughs> but uh, are decent enough but uh it's going to be open this week now they're going to come get it this is the last week we'll have it i think so we'll they're either going to get it friday or or next monday so so if you've got things you want to put in there don't procrastinate bring it this week okay all right i think they'll take pictures of your ugly family members and the good looking ones too it doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> i hope y'all had a great afternoon what a great service this morning Amen. We saw baptism. We saw people being saved. We saw these this altar full of folks yeah. praying. Amen. And we know that's what it's all going to take. He taught us that this morning, reminded us of what God has taught us all these years. Yeah. We're going to have a good time tonight worshiping. Yes. All right? Y'all like old songs and new songs, right? Mm -hmm. We're going <laughs> to one of them Baptist theme songs right now, all right? <laughs> Let's stand together and sing victory in Jesus. Some sweet day, I'll 
I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing my name. sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song again, whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes, bless the First time to hear that little chorus. David, wait, I started calling you David. I'm sorry, bro. Waylon, Waylon told me it was one you didn't, we didn't know here. A song I fell in love with about 10 years ago. And uh, it has the most wonderful message. And 
Bill was talking about this morning, what a mess we have in this country. What a mess we have in our churches. But when we don't understand what's in his plan, what's we supposed to do? Bow that knee. Bow the knee. Let him speak to us. He'll lead us through these things we don't understand. Let's sing that chorus together again. Trust the heart of your Father when the answer goes beyond what you can see. Now leave, lift your eyes toward heaven and believe the one who holds eternity. When you don't understand the purpose of his plan in the presence of your King. Bow the knee. Let's sing that together one more time. Bow the knee. Trust the heart of your Father when the answer goes beyond what you can see. Toward heaven and believe the one who holds eternity. When you don't understand the purpose of his plan in the presence of your king, bow the knee. When you don't In the presence of the King, bow the knee, because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Love you. 
can face uncertain days because Christ lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I good part. I'll cross the river. I'll find life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory. Sing it, church. I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he reigns because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know. Chorus one more time together. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. I think God deserves a hand because his son lives. <laughs> amen. Oh, amen. 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 Father, oh, we thank you so much for the fact that we have a living Savior. We don't have to go look for him in some tomb or monument. We can see him through our heart. We thank you for that Holy Spirit that opens the word. Let's, let's speak, as it will, in just a few minutes from Brother Bill. We thank you that he's always dedicated his life to speaking your word. And God, tonight I pray that it's anointed and that it touches hearts. And we'll leave here knowing it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. We love you and we thank you for all you do in Christ's name. Amen. You all be seated. Master, may I be so honest? Could I admit the way I I'm hurting, it seems that you've forsaken. I wonder if your love for me is real. Though my friends think I am happy, unaffected by this trial, they can't see the pain I'm hiding just underneath my smile. Master, I can't live this way anymore. So today I make my choice. 
I choose to believe that you are faithful and my heart is in your hands and this mystery that I face today is part of a greater plan I choose not to be discouraged when the sun will not break through I have the choice of trusting you so Lord this is what I choose I know this road will not be easy and I know I'll have my weaker days then oh Satan you will tell me I don't mean it when I say I'll trust God all the way but that really doesn't matter I refuse to hear him out through my faith I'll find the power that'll overcome all doubt oh Lord I've never felt so strong as when I'm resting in your arms. I choose to believe that you are faithful and my heart is in your hands and this mystery that I face today is part of a greater plan. I choose not to be discouraged when the sun will not break through. I have the choice of trusting you. So Lord, this is what I choose. That this mystery that I face today is part of a greater plan. I choose not to be discouraged when the sun will not break through. I have the choice of trusting you. So, Lord, this is what Gonna trust you, Lord. I choose. Lord, putting our hands together and just thank the Lord, amen, for all he's done for us. And it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you, Brother Richard, for that great song, amen. Uh, I would sing for you. I do have a pretty good voice. I just tear it up getting it out, all right? So uh, I'll spare you. But uh, it's good to be here tonight. Good to have my wife, Wendy. Wendy, wave at everybody. They don't know who you are. And it's uh, always a joy to have her. We just celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary uh, back in June. We have 41 this uh, coming summer. We were talking about what we might do for our 40th anniversary. And Wendy said, well, I think I'm going to take you to Australia. And I said, man, that's big for 40. What are we going to do for 50? She said, I'm going to come get you. <laughs> so... Uh, but uh, it's good to have her tonight. Good to see each and every one of you. Turn to your neighbor and say, you look awesome for a Sunday night. All right, tell them that. 
Take your Bible, if you will, and turn to the Gospel of John and find chapter 1. John chapter 1. And I want to talk to you for a few moments tonight about following Jesus. Following Jesus. I want to make a statement tonight, and I'll probably make it again before the end of the week. Uh, here at this church, I know that you believe the Bible is the inerrant, infallible Word of God. There's no error in the Bible. It's accurate in every area that it speaks. Somebody said, do you really believe that Jonah got swallowed by a big fish and was sustained for three days and three nights, and that fish threw him up on the shore of Nineveh, and he went and preached? I said, yeah, I don't have any problem believing that. Matter of fact, if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed a fish, I'd believe it. Somebody asked Adrian Rogers one time, said, uh, uh, do you really believe there's a fish out there that could swallow a man like that? He said, look, if God wanted to, he could make a fish with three bedrooms, two baths, no problem to him. Amen. <laughs> and so um, I believe the Bible is the Word of God. Now, here's a statement I'm going to make, I want to make. For this church and a lot of churches, there's many of us that take the Bible literally. We believe the Bible but we don't take it seriously. We read these stories and we think, well, that's an ancient story for an ancient people at an ancient time. But I, I, I got news for you. When Jesus says something, he means it. And it's for us today. Come on, amen. It's not just a good story. It's not just something that we read to take up time. But I, I, want, us to, I want us to really zero in tonight on this subject of what it means to follow the Lord. Now, I want us to look at verse 35 of John chapter 1. We're going to read quite a few verses together, and I'm going to make a little running commentary as we go through the Scripture. Again, the next day, John. Now, this is John the Baptist. Everybody say John the Baptist. You remember John the Baptist. He was the forerunner of Christ. He said, I'm not the one. I'm the one that's going to point you to the one. Come on, amen. I, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes, John the Baptist said. He said, uh, but he's coming, and I, I'm a voice crying in the wilderness. So this is John the Baptist with two of his disciples. Now, here's two disciples that have been following John the Baptist. Verse 36, and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold, the Lamb of God. Aren't you glad tonight that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him shall not perish, amen, but have everlasting life. Thank God we had a Lamb a sacrifice to take our place at the cross. The two disciples heard him talking about John the Baptist speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following and said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. It was about the tenth hour or four o'clock in the afternoon. And one of the two that heard John, John the Baptist, speak, and followed him, Jesus, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, I want you to notice how many times the word found is used in the rest of the Scripture we're going to read tonight. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now, when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. The following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found, a lot of folks finding folks. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, come and see. If we had more time tonight, I would take you back a little earlier and we would study and read about the baptism of Jesus. When Jesus began his earthly ministry, it's amazing to me that he began it with water baptism. Why in the world would Jesus, God in the flesh, the spotless, sinless Lamb of God, have need to be baptized? Matter of fact, when you read the Bible, when Jesus approached John the Baptist about baptizing him, do you remember what John the Baptist said? I have need that you baptize me, not that I baptize you. So why would Jesus be baptized? Well, let me give you a couple of thoughts. Number one, 
he identified with sinful humanity. The Bible says he was a savior without sin, a man who knew no sin, but he became sin, that you and I could be right with God. But he identified with us. And I want you to know he was all God. He never ceased to be God. He was not half God and half man. He was all God and all man. Come on, amen. Jesus, the God-man. Matter of fact, Paul wrote uh, when he was writing to young Timothy, and he said, hey, he said there had to be a place where God and man could meet, and there's one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So Jesus identified with us. Can I help you tonight? This will encourage you. This will bless you tonight. It really will. Do you know that Jesus has felt every emotion you've ever felt? Do you know Jesus has been faced with every temptation that you've ever been faced with? I know without sin. But what I'm saying to you tonight is this. He knows what it's like to feel lonely. He knows what it's like to feel rejected. He knows what it's like to feel isolated. He understands us. Come on, amen, he knows. And he cares for us. But there's another reason he was baptized. He inaugurated his public ministry. When a man was going into the priesthood, he would come before the tabernacle or the temple, whatever the case might be, and one of the things they would do to get him ready for his priesthood is they would pour oil on his head. Not just a little little vase of oil, but a lot of oil. It would flow down his hair into his beard and onto his garment, signifying the uh, anointing of the priesthood. Now, I want you to remember that when Jesus came up out of the water of baptism, it was as if a dove came from heaven and lit upon him, signifying that he is the Messiah, the anointed one. Come on, amen. And I want you to understand something tonight, that uh, just like uh, that oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit, the dove's a picture of the Holy Spirit, and so he began his earthly ministry as our high priest here on earth that would yet go to heaven and is now even praying for us while we're having this service tonight. Now watch this. Are you, are you ready? Say, I'm ready. Since that day, watch this, every serious follower of Jesus has been baptized in water. Matter of fact, it, said, it was said of the new believers in Acts chapter 2 that they gladly were baptized. Now, I'm going to tell you something tonight. I, I have a real problem with folks who say they get saved, but they don't want to get baptized because, you see, I want you to know that, listen, that is your profession of faith. Walking down the aisle is wonderful, and we identify publicly with Christ, but really your baptism is your profession of faith, and it also identifies you with Christ. When you're baptized in water, uh, just like Brother Hugh baptized these two gentlemen this morning, when he put them under the water, he was saying, hey, I believe in the death and burial of Jesus. Jesus Christ. And then when he raised them up out of the water, they, here's what baptism said. I believe Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead. But also, it's a picture of what happened to you. Somebody said it years ago. It's an outward expression of an inward experience. And when you're put under that water, you're saying the old man is dead. When I was baptized, the old Bill Britt is dead. I'm alive in Christ. And every sincere follower of Christ has gladly been baptized. So I want to ask you a question now. You may have been a church member a long time. We had a brother baptized today, been saved for a while, but had to get his baptism right. Come on, amen. Have you been baptized in water since you have believed? Now, I've been a Baptist all my life, and people, you know, kind of downplay baptism, and, and I agree wholeheartedly with what you said this morning. That water can't wash away your sin. That baptistry doesn't save you, but still, baptism is an extreme important step in our walk with Christ. So have you been baptized since you got saved? Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, I I made a profession of faith when I was 7 or 8 or 10, and I got baptized, and then I got saved when I was 20. You didn't get baptized when you was a kid. You got wet. I wear a wedding band on my finger. I can take this wedding ring off and still be married. It's a symbol. It doesn't make me married. It's a symbol that I am married. It says to people that see this on my left hand, I belong to somebody. And baptism doesn't save you, but it says you belong to Jesus and that you're a sincere follower of Jesus Christ. 
You say, well, I grew up in a, a, a church tradition where we baptize babies. Babies can't be baptized because babies can't repent and by faith receive Jesus Christ. And so listen, you get saved and then you follow the Lord in bat. Come on, somebody help me here. Baptism. This ring would mean nothing if I wasn't married. What makes it meaningful is I am married. Being dunked in that pool up there has no meaning unless you've been saved. What gives it meaning is you've given your life to Jesus Christ. So some of you tonight, you need to get out of your seat. You need to come to your pastor and say, Brother Mike, I need to get my baptism on the right side of my salvation because I want to be a serious follower of Jesus Christ. Wendy and I flew into a city to start a revival meeting. Pastor and his uh, wife took us out to dinner on the way to the uh, hotel. And the pastor said, my wife and I have been really restless lately. We just knew something wasn't right. We've been praying and seeking the Lord. And the Lord showed us we didn't get saved when we were kids. We got saved as young adults. Therefore, even though I'm the pastor, I've never been scripturally baptized. He said, would you baptize me tomorrow night at the end of the service? And I said, be happy to. So here, Brother Mike, here's the evangelist of the pastor getting into baptistry. And the deacon started taking bets on who got saved. Amen. But anyway, just kidding. <laughs> So I baptize the pastor, I get out of the baptistry, he baptized his wife, and no less than 10 people came down the aisle saying, hey, don't let the water out. We want to be sincere followers of Christ. My pastor, Dr. Gavin Spinney at First Baptist Halton, called me, and he said, hey, Bill, this has been a while back. He said, man, I, I've been wrestling with this. He said, I made a profession of faith when I, I was a kid, and I, and I got you know, put in the baptistry, but I really didn't get baptized because I didn't get saved when I was 17 and here I am, the pastor of the church, and I've never been scripturally baptized. What do I do? I said, get baptized. He said, well, we'll do it on a Wednesday night. I said, no, we're going to do it on Sunday morning. Come on, amen. <laughs> and because of the obedience of our pastor to follow the Lord in believer's baptism, revival came to our church. So here, I'm just introducing the message. I'm not preaching yet. Are you with me? You get saved like five precious souls did this morning. Then you follow the Lord in baptism like the two gentlemen we saw this morning. And then you follow Jesus. What does it look like when you follow Jesus? Let me give you three Ps, all right? Here's my three Ps. I'll, I'll preach them as quick as I can. I'll tell you like Jennifer Lopez told her last boyfriend, won't keep you long. Amen, y'all ready? <laughs> First P is this, Priority. Everybody say priority. John the Baptist is following, or these two men are following John the Baptist. John the Baptist says, hey, boys, that's, that's the one I've been talking to you about. He's the Lamb of God. That's Jesus. He's the one I've been, I've been preaching about this coming. That's Jesus, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples that had been following John the Baptist, watch this, stopped following John the Baptist, started following Jesus. What a picture. So simple, but yet so powerful. Here's two men following John the Baptist. They stop following John the Baptist. They start following Jesus. Isn't that what happens when you get saved? You stop going certain places. You stop doing certain things. You stop thinking certain ways, and all things become new, and you start following Jesus. Come on, amen. amen. And he becomes what? The Lord of your life. <laughs> My wife asked me one night, if I would watch a beauty pageant with her, look at me. Do I look like a man that wants to waste my life? <laughs> I'd rather have a nosebleed than a charley horse at 3 o'clock in the morning. I'd rather be chained to a bed of nails at a Lady Gaga concert. I'd rather give birth to a flaming porcupine. I don't want to watch a beauty pageant. But I did. I thought, you know, Wendy watches hours and hours of sports with me. I can watch a beauty pageant with her. And so they interviewed a former Miss America, and she just kind of blurted out, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I thought, man, that is incredible. But then she said, but he's not the most important thing in my life. And I did exactly what you did until she said, Jesus is not the most important thing in my life. Jesus is my life. I got a news flash for you. Jesus doesn't care about being important to you. He demands to be preeminent to you. He's Lord. He won't play second fiddle. He won't get on the back burner. He won't follow another God in your life. 
Listen, we have a lot of gods that we follow. Whatever takes up your time, your energy, your money, your focus, that's your god. You see, there's nothing sinful about sports, but sports makes a terrible god. And we're more worried about Johnny making the ball team than we are Johnny making the kingdom. I, I tell you what gets me. These mamas and daddies that weren't any good in sports trying to be good through their kids. Hey, by the way, let's just get real. All of us that played high school athletics, the older we get, the better we were. And these parents, they got their kids out there doing all this travel ball, never in church. They'll spend $400 on a bat, won't buy their kid a Bible. I, I never had a problem with scholarshiping kids to youth camp when I was a pastor. But Brother Mike, what bothered me, Brother Hugh, what bothered me is when a daddy would come to me and say, we can't afford to send our kids to youth camp, but they just sent their kids to a sports camp that cost $1,000. And by the way, can I help some of you mamas and daddies and grandmas and grandpas? Don't get mad when little Johnny doesn't play. You know why he doesn't play? He ain't no good. <laughs> he couldn't hit water if he fell out of a boat. <laughs> Jesus demands to be number one. Paul, when he wrote the book of Colossians, he said Jesus is preeminent. Jesus doesn't care about being important. He demands to be the priority of your life. That's why we don't have any excuse not to be here the next three nights. We have no excuse not to pick up our Bible and read it every day. Spend some time praying to the Father, inviting people to come to Jesus, giving our tithes and offerings. Come on, somebody help me right here. Because Jesus is Lord of our life. Second thing I want you to see. Not only priority, but plans. He calls the plans. There's two disciples. They stop following Jesus. They start following John the Baptist. And they said, hey, Lord, where are you going to be hanging out? He said, come and see. So it was about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So they just went and stayed with Jesus. You know, here's the, here's the thing I'm trying to get you to see. When you get saved and you get baptized and you start following Jesus, he becomes the Lord of your life. Listen, he's the Lord of your life, and then he makes the plans for your life, not you. Now, I won't get a little ahead of myself here. Some of you are retired, and you're just sitting back and enjoying life. God may want you to move out of the country and be a missionary the rest of your life. A friend of mine told me about a 49-year-old lady who had been a pastor's wife most of her life. Her husband died. They got home from the funeral. She got on her knees by her bed. Her heart was broken in a million pieces. She was crying her eyes out to the Lord. Lord, you're going to have to help me. My heart's broken. I've spent all these years being a pastor's wife. I've loved the ministry that you had for my husband and myself. But then she said, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to go on, but I just don't think you're through with me. And God spoke to her very plainly, said, no, I'm not through with you. And she went to South America, became a missionary, and came back at the age of 80. That's Jesus being priority. That's Jesus calling the plans. Some of y'all might be in the middle of a very lucrative career. God may shut that down and send you to the mission field. He may call you to be a pastor. He may call you to be an evangelist. He may call you to be a youth pastor, work with children. He may call you to start a ministry right here in Washita Parish, some unique ministry that God is birthing in your spirit. But what I'm saying to you is this. When you get saved, you're not your own anymore. You've been bought with a price. The blood of Jesus paid for your sin. Jesus owns you. You're a bond slave. He's Lord. We don't believe that, though. We just come to church, sit on our blessed assurance, waiting on the rapture bus to come pick us up and just kind of do our thing. When's the last time you stopped and asked Jesus what he wanted for your life? All right, listen to me. Let me give you a couple of verses. Don't turn to them. Mark chapter 3, verses 13 and 14 says, And Jesus went up into a mountain, listen to this, and he called him unto him whom he would, listen, and they came to him. Brother Mike, we got to go four nights to revival? Hey, we got brothers and sisters getting their heads cut off for the gospel, and we think it's a burden to come to church four nights. Amen. 
Jesus, how much is it going to cost? How long are we going to be there? Are we going to be comfortable? Hey, by the way, can I just give you a little, I'm going to put a little bug in here. Y'all listening to me? Is this on? Y'all listening to me? Don't anybody, listen, please, don't any, please, don't anybody in this church come to me this week and say, that sermon was too long, these seats are too hard, the building's too cold, the building's too hot, yeah, nah, 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 nah. don't come up, I will take my shirt off and go redneck on you. <laughs> and if that doesn't work, I'll go hood. I've seen our brothers and sisters persecuted for the gospel. He went up into a mountain calling to him whom he would. And they came to him. Listen, listen, this is the big thing. That they might be with him. But you know the Bible's not an end in itself. We have the Bible so we can be with God. We can know God. We can be with Jesus. We pray so we can be with him. Come on, Amen. We worship him to be with him. Now, you've got to do everything under the sun to get people to I'm talking about saved people, church people, so-called saved people to come to church. We ought to be, listen, you know one of the things that disappointed me when the churches opened back up after COVID? I thought we'd have to have the deputy sheriff out here on the highway directed traffic. We'd be so hungry to get back in the house of God. They went up into a mountain, he called unto him whom he would. That they might be with they came to him, that they might be with him. And listen to the next part of that, those verses. It says, and then he sent them out to preach the gospel, cast out demons, and heal the sick. You see, there's no power to do ministry until we're with him. Amen. There's no power to do ministry until we know him, until we are in God's plan for our life. Come on, amen. I tried to be a pastor. That's not God's call on my life. We had people saved, our churches grew, but I, I will tell you, I was miserable. I, I made most of my church members miserable. Come on, amen. You see, God's called me to do what I do. And when I'm doing what God's called me to do, he empowers me to do it. He blesses, come on, somebody say amen. amen. He blesses it. Jim Elliott took four of his buddies down to Ecuador back in the 50s to win the Aka Indians to Christ, before one of them was converted, all five men were speared to death. They left young wives and young children. If you've never read the uh, book, At the End of the Spear, or if you've never seen that movie, or if you've never read the book Through Gates of Splendor by Elizabeth Elliot, you need to read those books. They're classics. Somebody said, what a waste. You've left young wives. They left young children, and now they're dead. Not one of those men or women in that tribe are saved. Let's fast forward about 50, 60 years. The whole tribe's been saved, and they've been evangelizing South America for 50 years. So here's my question. Is Jesus worth it? I said, is Jesus worth it? Jim Elliott could have played any sport at any D1 college. He was a very athletic, very talented young man, but yet he had a call on his life, and he wrote in his journal. You remember that quote that's been quoted so many times? A man is no fool to give up that which he cannot keep, to keep that which he cannot lose. And let me give you a spiritual principle tonight. The only thing you'll ever possess in your life is what you give away. Is anybody getting anything out of what I'm saying? Priority. Plans. Here's the last one. Purpose. I, I ask you when we read our scripture to notice how many times people found somebody. Somebody found somebody that found somebody that found somebody. Now the word found there in the original language doesn't mean I bumped into them at the store. Here's what it means. I went hunting for them. I went out seeking them. Remember what Jesus said? Here is really, this, this is, this is a part of Jesus' job description. He said, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. You remember when he spoke to the woman at the well, that Samaritan woman? He said, I have need to go through Samaria. You see, he sent his disciples out in the middle of a storm, 
and he got in the boat, you know, with them and calmed the storm. And you know where they went to? They went over to a place where there was a man full of demons and Jesus cast out. You see, I'm telling you, Jesus was busy seeking and saving that which was lost. Who are you seeking after? When's the last time somebody's been baptized in this church because of your witness? Think about this. Why didn't Jesus, the moment we got saved, when I was at high school, when I got saved, the moment I got, why didn't the Lord just take me on to heaven? Because he left us here to be salt and light in a dark world. God doesn't have plan B. We're it. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're it. Turn back to him and say, we're the best he has. Turn back to him and say, scary. Can I ask you a question or not? I'm talking to deacons, Sunday school teachers. I'm talking to everybody. I'm talking to Bill Brett. When's the last time you witnessed to somebody? I was getting Wendy some perfume at Dillard's one time, and I was standing there at the counter, and uh, the la- a lady came up next to me, and she asked another lady behind the counter, she said, may I smell eternity? And I thought, Merry Christmas, Bill. I said, that's an interesting question. I said, do you know that eternity has two fragrances? She said, I wasn't aware of that. What are they? I said, heaven and hell. You see, God opens all kind of opportunities. Can I hear an amen right there? (laughs) When's the last time you witnessed to somebody? When's the last time you tried? When's the last time you passed out a gospel tract? When I first went in evangelism, uh, Wendy and I were living in Halton, Louisiana then before we moved to Texas. And if I was home on a Saturday night, me and my buddies would go down to the nightclubs under the Red River Bridge and witness. And we'd go over to the Cowboys Lounge in Bossier and we'd witness. And one Saturday night I was out there by myself and I just decided I was going to put a gospel track under everybody's windshield wipers at the Cowboys Lounge. And I was on Saturday night, Monday morning, A lady from our church called me. She said, were you at Cowboys Lounge putting tracks under people's windshields uh, on Saturday night? I said, yes, ma'am, I was. She said, well, a lady just left my house, had one of those tracks in her hand. She came out of that bar. She was empty on the inside. She got out of her car. When she saw that little piece of paper, got back in her car, read it, got saved. I was in Oak Grove, Louisiana, Brother Richard, went to McDonald's to get a bottle of water on the way to church to preach. Invited the young lady that was working there. She said, I can't come tonight, I'll be there tomorrow night. And people tell you that all the time. But she showed up and got saved. Brought a friend the next night, she got saved. It was the last time you won a soul. Think about it. I don't know how many of y'all are members of this church, most of us. What if everybody here in this section, this section, this section, this section, this section, this section, section, what if all of us in this room tonight, between now and December the 31st, would get a burden for a lost man or woman, boy or girl, teenager, see them come to Christ, walk them down this aisle, and they get back, listen, look at all the baptisms this church would have and the excitement that would come to this fellowship. That's why God left us here. You know, we're like the rivers of Alaska. We're frozen up at the mouth. Come on, amen. We never open our mouth and talk about Jesus. What does it mean to follow Jesus? You've got to get saved. You've got to get baptized in water. And then you follow him as Lord of your life. He's priority. He calls the shots. He makes the plans. And your purpose is here to be a witness until you die. We just had a man in our church. He got COVID. He was in Willis Knighton, 99 days. He began to recover. They put him in rehab. Two days later, he began to digress. They put him back in the hospital, and he died. Revival came to Willis Knighton Hospital through that man. We have a nurse in our church who is the head nurse there at Willis Knighton North. She said, I've never seen a patient have an impact in 30-something years of being in nursing like this one man did. 
and he was dying. He was on the ECMO machine. And I don't have time to go into all that. Some of y'all know better what that is than I do. But he was on the ECMO machine. And to be on the ECMO machine, you've got to have somebody that's skilled in that machine in your room 24 hours a day. And you've got to have a registered nurse. So they took shifts, eight-hour shifts or 12-hour shifts, whatever. And here's what the brother said that's now with the Lord. He said, I was like, I was like Paul chained to a Roman prisoner. I hammered him for 12 hours. I was preaching at Cypress Baptist Church in Benton. You know, one particular time that I preached there in the second service, before I ever preached, I just got up and said, folks, God's moving, and I believe there's a man here that's empty on the inside. You're frustrated. You've tried religion, and it's left you hopeless and empty and frustrated. And a guy stood up, 30-something young man, stood up in front of about 1,500 people, and he said, it's me. And he came forward, about six other men got saved before the service ever started. That young man was a professional fisherman, Nick LeBrun. And now, Nick, you know, when you, when you fish in these tournaments now, you've got a guy in your boat that weighs the fish. And he said, hey, those guys, they know when I get in my boat for eight hours, they're going to hear about Jesus. Is anybody listening to me? When Paul and Silas, this, this just jumped out at me here a while back. When Paul and Silas were in that Philippian jail, they had been beaten. Their backs were ripped open. They were in a dungeon, probably open sewer. They were hungry. They were cold. They were hurting. And the Bible says they began to pray and praise God. And listen to what the Bible says. And the prisoners were listening to them. An earthquake hit that place. Cell doors flew open. Everybody's chains fell off. The Roman soldier's going to kill himself. You remember what Paul said? Do yourself no harm. We're all here. Now, wait, wait a minute. We're all here. What do you mean we're all here? If I was in prison and my cell door flew open and my chains fell off, he gone. <laughs> you know what I believe, Brother Mike? I believe the whole prison got saved. Because the Bible says they were listening to them. When Cornelius came to know Christ, he had that vision, and Peter was coming to share the gospel with those Gentiles. You know what the Bible says? Cornelius said, I had a vision of a man, and he was going to come speak to me words, the gospel. There's power in the gospel. God left you here to be a soul winner. Can I hear an amen? Let me, let me, let me. Share this with you and I'll be done. I'm looking forward to going to heaven. My mom died on December the 20th, nine days short of her 98th birthday. She's in heaven. My dad died 22, three years ago. He's in heaven. I've got uncles and aunts in heaven, cousins, friends in heaven. We've had five or six of our close friends in the last few years die young, die young, and go to heaven. I'm looking forward to going to heaven. But the main reason I'm looking forward to going to heaven is to see Jesus. Amen. I, I want to see Jesus. I, I came across a song last night, and I played it while I was going to sleep. It's by Terry Gibbs. She's a blind lady. And the song says, I've never seen a sunset. I, I've never seen the waves uh, crash on the shore in the moonlight. And she said, I've never seen this or that. But the first person I'll see is Jesus. I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus. But you know, what? I'll tell you something else. Are, are if you're listening, say, I'm listening. I'm looking forward to meeting all the people we've read about in the Bible all these years. You know who I want to meet? I want to meet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those were three bad dudes. They said, we're not bound down to your stinking idol. Our God's able to deliver us, but even if it doesn't, we're not bound down. They heated up the furnace seven times hotter than ever before. And the guy that threw them in died because it was so hot. And they were walking around there with Jesus. They came out, their hair wasn't singed, and there was no smell of smoke on their garment. You can't go in a convenience store in Louisiana and do that. I want to meet them. Daniel, what was it like to have a lion as a pillar? Moses, what was it like to hold up that rod and see the Red Sea part and go across on dry, uh, dry dusty ground? John, what was it like to be cast 
on the Isle of Patmos and exile. And God call, call you up into the third heaven and write the revelation. Paul, what was it like to be struck down on the road to Damascus and write two-thirds of the New Testament? Timothy, what was it like to be mentored by the great apostle Paul? Peter, what was it like to stand up on the day of Pentecost and see 3,000 people get saved? And then they're going to look at you and me and say, I want to talk to you a minute. <laughs> hey, hey, Bill, I want to talk. Me, I'm, I'm a nobody, man. Wait, I, I didn't write the Bible. I, I wasn't in the Bible. And by the way, some of y'all need to start reading your Bible because you're going to get to heaven and there's going to be a guy named Obadiah walk up to you and you're going to say, I don't know who you are. And he's going to say, I had a book in the Bible and you're going to be embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, I want to talk to you. What if Paul came up to you and said, I want to talk to you? Peter, John. What, what are you going to talk to me about? I want to ask you some questions. Is it true you all had a Bible? They didn't have a Bible like we got. We got four Bibles on average in, in the American home and we never read them. Could I just confess something to you? I'm embarrassed how little I know about the Bible after all these years I've been saved. And then they're going to say, did y'all have something called a car? You could drive 50, 60, 70. Yeah, yeah, we had all that. Did y'all have an airplane? You could be anywhere in the world about 24 hours. Yeah, we had that. Y'all had a cell phone? Yeah, we had a cell phone. I have on my phone, some of y'all may have it, it's called WhatsApp. And I talk to my guys that we work with all over the world. I can talk to them free over the Internet. I can sit in Houghton, Louisiana, and talk to people in Bangladesh, in India, and, and all over Africa. Come on, amen. Isn't that something, India? And then they're going to say, that's amazing. Y'all had a Bible, a car, an airplane, a cell phone. I want to sit down here, and I want you to tell me all that you did to get the gospel out with those things. And most of us are going to bow our heads and say, not a whole lot. I'm not against going on vacation and having some downtime. I kind of enjoy it myself. But I want to tell you something. That's just about the only reason we use an airplane for the most part in the Christian world. Listen, we don't, we don't go on a mission trip. We, don't, we won't give, uh, sacrifice our money and time to go tell some folks about Jesus. We, we, won't even do, we won't even walk across the street and tell our friends about Christ. If I had a the cure for cancer in my pocket tonight. If I could walk into a hospital room and give a cancer patient this medicine and they would be healed, but I never took it out of my pocket, I would be not only wrong, I would be immoral. What if I walked into a hospital room, there's a man or woman, they're dying of cancer, I got the cure for cancer in my pocket, and I talked to them about hunting, fishing, sports, grandkids, kids, weather, but I never give them the medicine. What kind of friend would I be? Well, I've got news for you. We've got the answer. And we seldom ever take it out and share it with somebody. You see, what does it mean to follow Jesus? You get saved, you follow him in believer's baptism to identify with him, and then he becomes the Lord of your life. He calls the shots, and he is the reason that we're here. The purpose that we're here is to tell people about Jesus Christ. So I want you to lay your life down by the word of God tonight, and I want to ask you a question. Are you really a serious follower of Christ? Let's pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around. I don't want us to get ready to go home. I want us to get ready to do business with God. Hey, listen, we're praying for revival this week. You know what revival is? Charles Finney said revival is nothing more or less than a new obedience to Christ. John said to the church at Ephesus who had all the right doctrine, he said you've left your first love, return to your first love. You remember how it was when you first got saved? You were so hungry for the Bible and prayer you couldn't, you couldn't help but talk about Jesus everywhere you went. Listen, we need to have that kind of revival. 
So I want to ask you something. I want them just to begin to play softly whatever song we're going to sing tonight. Before Brother Richard leads us, I want us to just think about the message tonight. Let me ask you a few questions. How many of you could, you could fast, you, you consider yourself a child of God? You've been saved. We had five saved this morning. Thank God for them. And I wonder how many of you tonight could say, Bill, I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. No doubt about it. Can I see your hand up real high all over this room? God bless you. Put your hands down. Here's my next question. How many of you that are saved tonight have never followed the Lord in believer's baptism? Some of you made a profession of faith years ago. You got dunked in water, but you got saved later, and you never followed the Lord in baptism. And just like our brother did this morning, got his baptism right. And I wonder, would there be one or two or three? Or I don't know, maybe a bunch. I'm not sure. Is there anybody here tonight say, Bill, if I'm going to be a sincere follower of Christ, I need to get my baptism in order. Can I see your hand up real high and say, that's me tonight. I need to take care of that. I'm going to wait just a second. Anybody? That's me tonight. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody else? I want to be a sincere follower of Christ. I need to get my baptism in order. Listen, here's what I want to ask you to do. When we stand and sing in just a moment, I want you to walk up to the pastor and say, Brother Mike, I need to get my baptism on the right side of my salvation. And I want to tell you, there's going to be liberation. There's going to be liberty in that tonight for you. But I want to ask you another question. How many of you, just, let me ask you just a simple general question. And you might have been to the altar this morning. We might need to come to the altar every service. I've been in revival meetings. I wasn't preaching. I had to go every night. God spoke to me about something every night. And I want to ask you this question. How many of you, let's just get real. After what we've studied in the Bible tonight, how many of you be honest say, Bill, I just need revival. I, I just need to get back to my first love. I just need a fresh touch of the Holy Ghost on my life. Can I just see your hand up across this room tonight? Come on. Here's what I'd like for you to do. I'd like for you just to get up out of your seat. Come join me up here at the altar. Would you do that? Come on, right now. Don't wait on anybody. Don't look around to see if anybody else is moving. This is between you and God. I found out God doesn't send group text. He sends them to us individually. If you can't kneel down, just stand up. Sit on the front pew. Make that your altar. You might want to bring your whole family and say, hey, we need to get serious about following Jesus in our house. Remember what Joshua said? It's for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. But I want to ask another question. Would there be even one? I know this is the Sunday night crowd for the most part. We're probably believers. But I don't ever assume that or take it for granted. And I, and I just want to ask you something. Is there anybody here tonight just say, Bill, I'm not sure about where I'm going to spend eternity. I don't want to go to hell, but I'm not real sure I'm going to heaven. Pray for me. Would you just slip your hand up real high tonight, tonight and say, that's me. I'm going to wait just a moment. I know it takes some courage to slip your hand up. Just so slip your hand up and say, that's me tonight. Anybody? Anybody? All right. We're going to just let these stay at the altar as long as they need to. If you're in your seat, would you stand up with me very quickly, very quietly? And I want you to practice what I've been preaching tonight, okay? We did this this morning. We're going to do it again tonight. How many of you tonight would just do this very simply? Turn to your neighbor and ask them, if you died tonight, if Jesus Christ came back tonight, do you know for certain you'll be with him for all eternity in heaven? Just turn to somebody and ask them that. If they say, I don't know, grab by the hand and say, come on, I'll go with you. Do it right now. Don't just stand there. Turn to somebody. Come on. You might help somebody get saved tonight. You might help them overcome their fear and give their life to Christ. Just turn to somebody right now. Quickly, quickly. Come on. Don't just stand there. Help somebody. Listen, if you won't witness somebody in this setting, you probably won't out there. It's a good time to practice right now. All right, I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. We're going to give others the opportunity to come. If you need to come for baptism, if you need to be saved, maybe you're looking for a church home and God's putting your, on your heart to be a part of this church family, I know you'll hear the word. I know you'll be loved and encouraged and you'll be, uh, you'll, you'll be helped in your walk with Christ. So whatever God's telling you to do tonight, come on. Maybe God's calling somebody to the ministry. You come tonight. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray you continue to move by your spirit. In Christ's name we pray as we sing. Just come Have to Jesus. Thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Come on, friend. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. 
humble me and make me after thy will while I am waiting yielded and I want everybody to look right here for just a moment while they're playing softly I want us to leave tonight praying for the lost okay how many of you have a lost family member or friend can I see your hand tonight Hey, would you just walk up here and let's gather around this altar. We're going to pray for them tonight. Come on. I want you to stand up here for them. Stand in the gap for your friend, your family member. Y'all can stop playing for just a moment. You know, if I get sick, I want Washington Baptist Church praying for me. I want Brother Mike to have me on your prayer list. But what concerns me tonight is our prayer list at church is full of, law, uh, full of sick people, but very few lost people. And I want us to get a burden tonight for a friend, for a family member. And I want, to say, I want to ask God to save them this week. Can we be so bold? Can we be so bold? I did this uh, on a Sunday night. There was a man standing by where Hugh is. He was 70-something-year-old grandpa. When everybody left, he just stood there, Brother Mike. He was shaking. He was crying so hard. I went down and put my arm around him, and I said, Sir, are you okay? He said, Not really. He said, I've got a, I think, 10- or 12-year-old granddaughter. She hates God, hates church, hates the Bible. She's just 10 or 12. He says, breaking my heart. And I said, let's ask God to save her. You know what? She got saved Monday night. I was at a church down in South Louisiana on a Sunday morning. This lady came to me and she said, uh, she said Brother Bill, she said, my husband's a hardworking man. We live in a beautiful home. We drive nice automobiles. We dress nice. He said, she said, I, I have a great life but my husband's lost. She said, would you pray to get saved? We pray, we pray and ask God to save him. He showed up that night. And uh, when he was walking out, he hit me on the back. About so hard, about, he's a big old fisherman. He about knocked the breath out of me. He said, brother, that was a blank of a sermon. And I said, well, amen. He came back Monday night. He said, can you be at my house in 20 minutes? I said, why? He said, I want to be saved. I said, get saved right now. You might get killed in a car wreck on the way home. He said, no, I want to get saved in my living room. Went to his house. He got saved. I said, well, I better leave. Y'all got to get up early. He, he, had, a, he had a commercial uh, fishing business. And uh, he said, you're not going anywhere. He said, I just got saved. We're fixing to have a party. <laughs> He's a Cajun. He got out the fish and the shrimp and the crabs. He said, you sit over there in my recliner. He said, we fixed to eat. He started cooking. I was over there praying, Lord, let a fisherman get saved every night of this revival. <laughs> so I want us to pray for our families tonight. And here's what I want us to do. I want us to call out their first name. We're going to start over here. And I want just, just holler out their first name. Anybody? Somebody else? Somebody else? Somebody else? Over here. Over here. Over here. Somebody in the pews. Why am I doing this? These are real people. Did you know everybody that's ever been born is alive somewhere right now? Either on earth or heaven or hell. This is serious, isn't it? So let's pray. And here's how I want us to pray. I want us to pray, God, first of all, take the blinders off their mind. The Bible says the devil, the God of this little, uh, the little, the God, little G of this world has blinded the minds of those that uh, believe not the gospel. Let's ask God to take the blinders off of them. And then let's ask God to make their heart tender for a witness. And then let's ask the Lord to send somebody by to witness to them and help it even to be us. And then let's pray that by Wednesday night we'll see the person we're praying for come to know Jesus. Amen? But we've got to get aggressive. I said, we got to get aggressive. We've got to start tonight. Text them. Call them. Say, I'll be by your house. I'm picking you up tomorrow night about 
quarter to six, five, forty. You know, however long it takes you to get to church. Sometimes I'll be in church and I'll, I'll tell Wendy, I said, man, where's the crowd? She said, Bill, they know it only takes seven minutes to get to church. They'll be here. <laughs> Just tell them you'll be by to get them, all right? So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, first of all, we want to thank you for saving us. Lord, we wouldn't, get, we wouldn't have a burden for lost people if you didn't live inside of us. We wouldn't care. But Lord, we care because you live inside of us and you care. And you came to seek and to save that which was lost. And I pray for this wife. I pray for this husband. I pray for this son and daughter, this mama, this daddy, this next door neighbor, this aunt, uncle, brother, sister, cousin. I pray for that work associate, that teammate, that schoolmate that we're standing up here praying for tonight. God, I pray you'd take the blinders off their minds. Lord, they've been blinded by the devil. And Lord, we know the devil's mighty, but you're almighty. And Lord, you could touch them right now. And I pray you'd feel the atmosphere where they are. They might be driving a truck down the highway. They might be in a hotel room. They might be in their recliner. They might, they might be, uh, I don't know, in a restaurant. I, I just pray, God, they would be overwhelmed by the presence of God. Make their heart tender. Or begin to just to stir up that soil in their heart where, Lord, when they hear the witness, they'll, they'll receive it. Convict them by the Holy Spirit. Draw them to yourself and save them. And, Lord, I remember there was a, a woman, a widow woman, who came before an unjust judge, and she wearied him. The Bible says. And finally he said, that woman's wearing me out. And he gave her her request. And your, your word says, we don't wear you out. The picture is, if that judge would listen to that woman who was nothing to him, how much more is our father going to listen to us? And answer us speedily, the Bible says. So God, may we be so bold tonight to ask you to see let us see people that we're praying for right now saved tomorrow night and Tuesday night and Wednesday night. Lord, help us to get aggressive. Lord, help us not to be intimidated. Help us not to be bashful. You've not given us a spirit of timidity, but a power and love and a sound mind. Fill us with the boldness of the Holy Spirit as we leave tonight. And may everywhere we go, may we tell somebody about Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done at this place today. Thank you for what you're going to do. Lord, I pray that by the time this meeting is over, you will absolutely amaze us as to what happens. You're a great God, and we ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Brother Mike. As these come to be seated, be, take your seat right quick. We're gonna have, we're gonna collect our offering tonight. Well, we we don't actually collect our offering anymore. We're not really doing that. We hadn't. Uh, but what we're gonna do is the love offering tonight. We want to collect a love offering for our evangelistic team that's here. And uh, one of the ways we're gonna do that, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try this tonight. We've never done this. We've never had a revival after COVID where we didn't take up the offerings anymore. We kind of quit that. But you see these wood boxes on the wall. That's what they're for. Those are offering boxes, or we got two offering plates up here. And if you would like to make a, a gift, uh, an offering, uh, everything you give will go to the evangelist this week. Now, listen, I let y'all off. I forgot to collect the offering this morning. So that means, church members, what you was going to give this morning, add that to what you're going to give tonight, add them together, and just give. Amen. Just give it. And uh, and it'll go toward the evangelist team uh, to the love offering for them because that's what keeps them on the road. And listen, the evangelist has never had it as hard probably as the last 12 months. There's many of them, I don't know how they how they keep it going these days because so many, as this, cancel, this revival here was last spring or last fall or spring and we've post, postponed and postponed and postponed. And so we're just glad that we finally see God doing this. Now tonight was an investment on the rest of the revival. It's a commitment for the rest of the revival, a plan. 
to go find them, to go find them. And so let's do that this week. And those of you tonight that raised your hand that hadn't been baptized since you got saved, come to me and give me your name, all right? Particularly if you go to church here and you'd like for us to baptize you, uh, we'll probably do that next Sunday morning. But just come to me and give me your name. I know some of you raise your hands, and we'll make sure you know the time and date when we're going to do that, all right? Any questions before we go? Hasn't it been good? To have been in the house of the Lord tonight. You asked us to pray for somebody, and I had I got to thinking I got to find somebody new because the ones I was praying for got saved back there this morning. <laughs> so got to find somebody else to be praying for. Also, Mr. Mr. And Ms. Thompson back there, Mr. Lester and them, they're, they're, they're new members. They joined Monday. I don't know if you can join Monday, but they did. They they joined the church on Monday. And uh, I told somebody, I didn't know if that was legal or not, but we're going to make it legal. Amen. <laughs> but they uh, they filled out their new member form, and they're going to be a part of us here to watch time. Let's stand to be dismissed. Offering boxes, by, there's an offering box by each door. And if you can give them that, or you can bring it up here and put it in the offering plate. Either way would be great, okay? Thank you for being here. Hugh, dismiss us.